There's certainly been no shortage of conflicts this year, much more than markets can digest. I want to bring in now Pete Troilo. He's a global security risk analyst at research from DevEx. And in a previous career, he also advised the U.S. government on foreign policy. Pete, let me get right into it. There has been no shortage of conflicts this year. We take a look at Brussels, where they are now in their soul-searching process. One of the big questions being raised is, could this have been preempted weeks before the attacks i mean the intelligence operatives have been warning that the next major attack on european soil is imminent well clearly you're seeing some of the shortfalls in the european security apparatus right now um, unfortunately a lot of european societies weren't set up to deal with this type of threat in fact no uh, no government is really really equipped adequately to deal with the complex and multifaceted uh, threat of, of terrorism. So right now I think you're seeing uh, really the Belgian authorities particularly under a spotlight trying to grapple with how to best protect and also prosecute these cases. Well for that matter what lessons can we in Asia take away from what's going on the ongoing turmoil in Europe? I mean when you look at ASEAN as a region we're working towards greater integration and part and parcel of that shared roadmap is you know, free or travel, easy travel and open communications. Absolutely. Globalization is driving some of this complexity. I think nation states still need to have, still need to build the security protocols and systems to protect the, their borders, uh, to ensure the security of their homeland, at the same time to facilitate this uh, communications of goods, services, individuals. Um, so ASEAN right now, I'm sure, is looking at the European situation, knowing some of the uh, sort of the underlying threats uh, the different countries in the region face, including terrorism, uh, and trying to, 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 to build those systems. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it alone. A lot of these, uh, the countries in, in Asia, obviously are developing countries. They don't have the government capacity as even European countries. Uh, so international countries, including the U.S., I think are going to be uh, are going to be called on to assist. Well, this is also where countries, developed nations like Japan come in, right? It's, uh, Japan's new security laws actually kick in today, and what it does is it lets them, the government exercise more freely its right to collective self-defense. In other words, if one of its allies is being threatened by a third country, they can call out the military. How does this change the dynamic in the region in light of uh, maritime tensions? Yeah, clearly this is a component of a bigger uh, sort of more proactive uh, posture from Japan. That includes all diplomatic tools at the Japanese government disposal, including foreign aid and diplomatic, and now security. Uh, Japan is realizing that to be a player in the Asian economy and in the global economy, they need to get out there a little bit more. Um, and China, the threat from China, uh, a, a more aggressive expansionist China, is certainly fueling some of this, some of this policy in Japan. Well, Pete, there's also tensions in the Middle East and also North Korea's antics and a slowing Chinese economy to contend with. How do you model these when you're uh, forecasting for your clients? Do you just try to rise above the noise? Somewhat. You don't want to be alarmist. Uh, however, there are, uh, there are major global programs that are certainly threatened by China. Uh, the global economy got almost accustomed to this rapidly growing Asian tiger uh, in China. And now that you're seeing some scale back, I think uh, you know, companies and countries around the world are, uh, are, are sort of changing their own strategies. So I don't think there's a uh, doom and gloom scenario with this, uh, with this latest slowdown in, in the end of the commodity super cycle, but I do think companies are, are, are forced to adjust. So you know, our, our advice on all this um, is, is, to, is to monitor the situation, uh, but clearly China is going to continue to be a major player, driving some of the global growth, and also as they boost their domestic uh, demand and consumption, it's a, it's a market for every company to look at. Right. Well, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the end of the so-called commodity super mm -hmm. cycle. I know you've done a fair bit of research on this, mm -hmm. and you say that this take us, takes us further away from our global development targets, for instance, to eradicate poverty by 2030. Right. Why is that so? Well, I mean, I think you have to start with your first question, which is security. I think security uh, in Asia and around the world is a prerequisite for, uh, for any type of sustainable development. But last year, the UN agreed on new, uh, new development targets, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are very uh, broad and very uh, aggressive. Um, and you know, as these, as the, the, the core question there really is, how are you going to pay for them? How are you going to pay for achieving these goals 
uh, improved health, improved education, um, cleaner environment, we have a new climate change agreement. So there's an awful lot of objectives out there and the question really becomes with Chinese slowdown, um, with some political instability in various places, who and how are we going to fund the new sustainable development goals? Well, that's certainly a question in a lot of these governments' minds. Thank you very much, Pete, for your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you.